Okay, looking here at new product development, just bring this slide up there. So an example here on the left from Starbucks, we launched a magazine, didn't last too well, and also a coffee maker or an orange juice maker, I can't remember. But they were always trying, they always knew that just because you're successful with one product doesn't mean to say, you know, you've got to rest on your laurels. Firms are always looking for new products, new ideas to help them move on, you know, avoid standing still. Okay, this will look familiar, obviously, the product life cycle and the adoption. So just to remind you that, you know, at that early stage, stage one, the innovator. So for new products, you know, we're looking at this from the, that's a consumer point of view. You're trying to get the innovators to buy it, the early adopters. And it's getting out that introduction phase. Or that's the, the tricky point there. So we're going to look at firms who have the stages to go through and how it's not always successful. So the idea is good ideas, as it says here, you know, maybe a great idea, but it don't, doesn't always translate into, as it says, workable, appealing products. So, for example, the Sinclair C5, way back in the 80s, it's, it's a classic case study here, you know, come out and say, look, here's a low cost, low pollution, easy to park means of transport. This will revolutionise, you know, how we get to work, etc., how we get around and you know, fantastic. And Clive Sinclair had you know, great success with you know electronics in the 70s, so he was held up as a you know a guru, a leading light. He was getting a lot of attention, and then they produced this Sinclair C5, and you'll see it here, um, and that was meant to be fit to go on the road. And I did see one of these sandwiched between two buses, and you feared for the guy's life who was in it because it was just not safe. It really wasn't. So. Um, I think there's one in the Transport Museum in Glasgow and someone has made it clear that it was donated, they won it in a prize. So what we have on the left here, the diagram, these are the stages that firms will go through. Now, check out different books, so have different you know, words in different order, etc. But it's the same thing, thing here. The first one is idea generation. So come up with ideas. Then you've got to think, OK, let's weed some out here. Let's think it through. Then you have a business analysis, then you design, you develop, you bring out new products, you test them, and then you put it into commercialization. So, and that's a traditional model, Booz, Allen and Hamilton, you know, the consultants, what they would adhere to. Now, this might seem strange, what is a new product? Because you're thinking, well, surely that's obvious, but... You know, it's quite subtle. First of all, you can have new to the world products, something that comes out and, you know, like the internet, and you think, wow, that's transforming. You know, streaming of music, streaming of TV, we've never seen, <coughs> never seen this before. So you get that, but those are few and far between. You'll also get products that are new to the company. So, for example, a company might be thinking, let's move into a different area. So, you know, it's not new to the world. But they'll think, you know, let's let's get into this. And I think there's a lot of companies trying to get into streaming, for example. I think Disney have set up their own channel for this. Um, but it's not new to the world. Or it could be a new product line. You know, something added to it. And I think, hey, let's have a new, uh, we've got, say, cosmetics. We've got, you know, I'm <laughs> struggling here, uh, perfumes. So let's add in, you know, dishwasher tablets. You know, totally strange, but bad example. But that's the idea, a new product line. Or it can be a new variation of existing products, and that's why you've got the one here, Crystal Pepsi. Like basically, if you imagine see-through Pepsi, um, it didn't catch on because people associate with the, that's called lemonade. So to drink something like lemonade, uh, but getting the taste of Pepsi, too difficult. So you know it can be a variation, and probably a lot of products fall into this category. A variation on something bigger, smaller, different flavour, etc. From this. And the last one here is a new position in the market where you try and say, OK, let's go a bit more up market or let's go more value for money or let's be more safety conscious. Something, you know, how we saw in the positioning, look as aid transformed itself from a, you know, for hospital, for sick people uh, into an energy drink. So it's, it's the same product, but a new position. And remember, positioning, you're trying to change the minds of consumers here. So that's, that's the idea, you know, what's a new product? Quite a lot of things, really. Let's look here at the idea generation. So who comes up with ideas for new products? Well, inside the firm, who would you think? 
well, you might have R&D, for example, you might have a department for this, but it could come from the owner, it could come from the customer, you know, from, from your um, salespeople, could come from people in admin, could come from anywhere. So that's why firms are always trying to brainstorm and come up with new ideas, think, use the phrase, you know, blue sky thinking and outside the box, etc. So they'll encourage it from this. And it's important that you give credence to all voices just because someone is at the top. It doesn't mean to say you know, they would necessarily get it right. So be attentive to this. And then outside the firm, well, you know, it could be your customers. It could be your, your, your you know, who come to you and say, you know, what about this? It could be consultants. It could be universities you could go to. You know, it could be inventors. You could, all firms are always on the lookout for this. It might even be you buy over a small firm. You think they've got a good idea. Well, let's buy them over here. So lots of places ideas come from. Now, the thing is this, lots of ideas, but, and a lot of time it takes up, but only one will become commercially viable. So it's 60 ideas, only one, and that, that 60 might be spread over two, three, four, five years, etc. So it's you know it's a, a, a long way down. And the thing is, these costs, you can only get them back because when you have a successful new product. So the successful new product has to pay for the failure of everything that's gone before it, which is why, you know, a lot of products, you know, maybe in the pharmaceutical industry, maybe in the movie industry as well, etc. They're saying, yeah, we know it's expensive, but we're paying for all these other ones that weren't expensive, we've wasted our money on. And we're talking about the decay curve, so I'll show you this in a second. Oh, that, I don't know, I think I've done this wrong. Oh, this is funny. So I've got on twice here. Yeah, very good. So my technical skills, no poids. So this is the decay curve. So if you look at the left hand side here, there's the number of ideas and there's the time and the, and the, the, the bottom axis. So as time goes by, and you, you must remember this, you know, the ideas fall, you weed them out, etc. So you get over here. So it's a decay curve. It's, but think of the time, the effort, the meetings, the investment that's gone to get to this stage. And I think it's just commercially viable at this point as well. And what up here is one, I think Kellogg Breakfast Mates, it was like, I think the inside this, this, the milk was inside the cereal, so you wouldn't have to, but you know, to the logistics, the problems, it didn't last too long. So that was a decay failure. So let's look at the idea screening. So this is where you look at the viability of the idea, you know, and this is where <clears throat> if you're risk averse, you say, oh no, that's too much of a risk, you drop it. Um, alternatively, you could take on too many projects. And you know, too much, and you spread yourself too thinly. You don't invest enough money, so there's a danger in both of them. Actually, should I put up maybe a picture of the Beatles here? Because I think the record company Decca at the time they said, "Oh, there's too many guitar bands; it won't last," and so they didn't take on the Beatles um, because they were risk averse. Someone else picks it up and says, "Yeah, let's try it here." Um, so the idea of opinions, you know, inside sales, production, finance, you, you ask around about this. Just for example here, the Arch Deluxe was a McDonald's one, which was more an upmarket burger. But the people who might eat upmarket burgers would not go to McDonald's. So they launched that, it failed, they dropped it. So maybe sometimes, you know, you've got to credit them for trying, but along the line, people have thought, yeah, that's good. Although, you, wouldn't you always like to be the person when something fails, you come back and say, I told you so, right? But from that, you learn things, you can learn from your mistakes. So, and obviously here, you look at resources, production plans. So you look, this idea, you know, are there any legal implications, any pro pro problems with the distribution? So if it gives you green light, you move to the next stage. Oh, I've done it again. Unbelievable. Un oh, goodness sake. And they employ me as well. Don't, don't, don't make any comment on that, please. Now you get the stage for the concept development. So you need more research, you know, on your customers, your distributors, your capacity. It could mean that if you say, okay, if we go on with this product, then do we have to stop production of another line along here? You know, so from this. And you look at the link between what customers ex expect and what you can deliver here. Uh, I think I've got one more phrase here. Yeah. And you'll use focus groups. Now, this, this is a classic coke right if you google it you'll get all these examples it's an american example which i'm not really taking too too much not that you're bothered with that but it was the idea of coke were losing out ground to pepsi uh, pepsi kept 
you know, the choice of a new generation, etc., catching up very slowly. Now, they might have only been getting up nearly by like half a percent, you know, every few years. But that turns out, you know, of a billion dollar industry. So Coke thought, OK, maybe Pepsi was more sweeter, so maybe they need to make their drinks sweeter. So they've tested it and people use focus groups and people, yeah, this is good. But what they didn't tell them was that it was replacing the existing Coca-Cola. You know, and of course, when they brought it out, oh, hell broke loose because people said, no, you never told us that it meant the Coca-Cola that we drink all the time has been taken away. So, you know, and it was boycotts, etc. And, you know, PR disaster and the company realised, oh, no, no, we're not taking away Coca-Cola, which they intended to do. So they then had two drinks. I think they called it Classic Coke and New Coke. I'm not, to tell you the truth, I'm not really sure what happened. Some people said it wasn't that much of a disaster because it meant they get publicity and they get more Coca-Cola drinks onto the market shelves. And, you know, and what they were really concerned about was the fact that part of the reason they, their sales had been eroding was because Pepsi had been, it was demographic. Pepsi had been targeting a younger audience who were growing up, buying more drinks, buying for their children. So Coke have, they actually changed their communication strategy and targeting strategy. So there's an example whereby maybe you weren't asking the right questions. You know, maybe you've got to think, oh, we didn't know you were doing this. So you can look it up as, as an example here, classic Coke. So you're now at the business analysis. This is where the numbers, the accountants come in. You're looking at profit margins and a stock go decision is made here, right? You look at your product mix, what about the demand? Key decisions, what will it sell for? How what your profit margins? Which segments, you know, what? how do you promote it? What about these early adopters? So you take a lot of care here. The one we've got here, the example is the, I think the Apple, this is before Steve Jobs came back into the company, the Apple Newton, I think it's called. It's like a handheld device. You scribble things on and it, it wasn't too effective. Now this was in the, the you know, late 80s, early 90s. So it was the right idea. But the technology wasn't there for it. You know, they couldn't make it properly. It got ridiculed in the Simpsons episodes, etc., which is a sure sign. And of course, you know, contributed to the malaise of um, Apple. And I think that's why when they brought out the iPad, they made sure it had the iPad in there, the i, rather than just the sort of Newton link there. So this is where you you should have been asking more stronger questions. So and you look at production. So this is where you're moving on with the product. Again, unbelievable. Just pretend that never happened. So, product development. Now, this is where you make the product. Prototypes, working models, etc. You know, the functional performance. You might have to alter it, fine tune it, etc. Smoothies example. Um, what they did is these guys came up with ideas. They went to a music festival and they said, basically, they made up the their fresh orange and their fruit juices with no added ingredients and they were saying they had a sign up saying should we give up our jobs to make these full time and you had to throw your empty box in a bin so one bin said yes one bin said no at the end of the day overwhelming yes so that's what they did you know they made the product there could have put in an, an example i read about never been able to find evidence of this of um a dog food they had made and the idea was it was powdered dog food that you would, it was apparently more nutritious and cheaper because you could package it better for the environment, etc. So you had um, the, but you'd boil it up and it would cool down, feed it to the dog. Two problems they found is when you boiled the kettle, um, it had to cool down, but the dogs would smell it and they would go crazy, you know, running around wanting this food. Pavlov's dogs, remember? You know, and then when it did cool down, they ate the food, they loved the food, but it gave them chronic diarrhea. So that's maybe the sort of thing you find out in more depth. It surprisingly, didn't run, unlike the dog. So test is what customers think. Now, have I done this stupid thing again? Yes, I have. Unbelievable. So looking here now at test marking, this is where you actually make the product and you test it on your consumers. So you might start with small scale tests with consumers, not you know the whole market. So you may pick an area, Scotland, etc., um, and a specific, specific area, and it's got to be representative. Um, what, what the example is, one company made a biscuit and they launched it in Scotland, and it was a great success. But what they realised was, they didn't realise, was Scotland 
and we eat chocolate biscuits for, for breakfast and etc so they ended up having to scrap they thought their sales would be like 50 million but they were maybe only 10 million because the scottish market was not representative of the entire area um, obviously you, it doesn't work for all products you know if you've made a car and you've spent 100 million you know the, the test market costs 1 million you know well you know, just forget it just go ahead because you're not going to waste money if it was the other way around you think okay let's test it and then see what happens here um what you might get is rivals might attempt to distort the market so if they see you're testing they could say right okay let's withdraw our promotion or let's maybe even increase the promotion to kill it off or you know deceptive etc the example with whisper if i remember is that they tested it and it was a great success but they realized it would have been too good too successful and they didn't have the capacity so what they said is they put the word out saying it didn't work it was a bit uh, disappointing but in the meantime they built a bigger factory an extra line they launched it and it was a success so the story goes um you know simulated test marketing is low key and under the market where you're just sort of maybe um trying it out to see if it's uh you know with asking people give it out a few people see what they think you know across the country and then just test it for them people could come back see from like yeah we like it here are we going to do this again so the last stage is a commercialization and and this is right so this is about the, how much money can be spent can you afford not to launch now this is an example here of colgate ready-made meals you know and how we got to this stage that people were thinking really you know colgate for teeth but not for a ready-made meal here so you've got everything finalized you launch it you've got budgets objectives tactics when you launch it is critical so you know maybe I, you might pull the launch because it's not the right time something's happened and the feedback and response you know and whether you're going to stick with it you know if it's not good after six months you pull it or you, you know let's persevere here so Poor results might just because you've got the segmentation wrong and the targeting and the budget, but this is the investment in. Remember that decay curve? That's why you spend a lot of money. So most new products or innovations fail because the reason, well, the size of the market's overestimated. Right? It's just not there. They're poorly positioned in the market. Maybe they ignored the market research findings, which is not always a bad thing, but maybe they just thought no no we're right they're wrong or the competition proved too strong remember the competition can come out and think okay well in response to your new product we'll improve ours we'll cut the price we'll improve the promotion we'll improve the distribution you know you just don't know how they're going to react here um, and this is possibly why imitation is more attractive than innovation you know that you think someone else launches it hey that's a success let's copy them for dead cell here is another example of a product a classic case study that failed basically it didn't know what kind of car it was meant to be it was named after the ford owner's son head cell so by the time it came out you know it was probably right at the time but it takes years to make and launch cars by the time they got it out they realized people wanted cheaper cars or more fuel efficient or smaller cars so this is one off-brand new product so it's um um it's a link I'll put it on at the site here um, from the Daily Telegraph uh, and it's the Colgate Ready Made Meals, Zippo Perfume and Hooters which I believe, I've never been there, is a restaurant chain in America where the waitresses, well the, the waitresses are employed because of their personality um, and they tried to launch an airline so you know, it didn't, didn't take off. Anyway, so you can read that. sum up majority, as we know majority of new products fail it's expensive it's time consuming and some firms are willing to take the risk while others are risk averse so it's a, a philosophy you know it's like a gung-ho attitude and um, the, oh, the example in here is from guardians of the galaxy and there's a scene in it whereby the character has been listening to music and i think a sony walkman and then someone said no this is this, what they're listening to on earth and it was the uh, microsoft's version of the uh, iTunes, um, the iPod, and it's made, it's done in the film as a wow because you're watching thinking Zoom, what's a Zoom? Everybody finds out oh it was a failed product launch. So that's a joke in the movie, but the guy doesn't know and they give them more songs to play. Um, and of course I think Microsoft said yeah they just tried to copy Apple, but 
they didn't think it through right and so key stages those stages we mentioned sometimes are followed sometimes they're not sometimes the owner may just say i want this end of story and as we mentioned the response of competition that's what's difficult to predict so last slide here um i like i, I love this one it said dog owners turning mar marijuana treats to ease firework stress so someone's come up with that you know treats for dogs to stress them and i, I don't know if it works but i think they're looking at dog suggests it might work so Hopefully that's, you know, how you'll be feeling after um, listening to this voiceover. Uh, not uh, stress, don't take the marijuana treats. It's not, please don't. So, thanks for listening.